Today, I'm gonna try to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Heart Gold with only ground type Pokemon. Ground types straight up have some of the best designs in the franchise, and also fantastic physical stats. With that said, their special stats are kind of lackluster and their speed is terrible. And the typing is unfortunately often paired with types that give the Pokemon a four times weakness, or in some cases, multiple. Heart Gold and Soul Silver do provide us with a great variety of really cool Pokemon though, so I'm hoping that will allow us to pull through this challenge. Although, as you'll see, there are some difficulties with our encounter methods for these. Let's see if we can beat Pokemon Heart Gold with only the first ground type that we find on each route, no items in battle, level caps in place, and the battle mode on set at all times. And while we're on the topic, how about a game built from the ground up with the utmost care, attention to detail, and epic frequent updates? Raid Shadow Legends, today's sponsor, and a free-to-play RPG for both mobile and PC with wicked strategic battles and numerous modes of gameplay. Speaking of updates, Raid is increasing its roster of awesome-looking champions with a brand new rarity, Mythical. A step above legendary champions, these new mythical champions have a special new mechanic called Metamorph that allows them to change between two different forms with unique Metamorph skills. You know what? Let me try this out. We've got Plain Old Sylph, and then we've got Edit Spectre. With abilities including writing video scripts at 3,000 words per hour and getting videos up every four days. Okay, that might be a bit unrealistic, but raids certainly are not. Summon these awesome mythical champions from brand new primal shards in the portal. Their two forms both use the same artifacts, accessories, masteries, and blessings, so be careful when choosing how to use them. And they're the most versatile champions ever seen in Raid. You can tailor your playstyle and create synergies across both forms. And if you want a free legendary champion, check out Soon Wukong, Raid's take on the mischievous Monkey King. All you've got to do is log into Raid on seven different days between now and October 23rd to get your hands on this awesome champion. And for the new players, only now you have a chance to get one of the best epic champions, Stagnite, as well as a skin for him designed by JonTron himself. Just use the promo code JTSKIN before October 7th. Also, if you click my link or scan the QR code right here, you'll get a free starter pack with this cool in-game loot. Don't miss out. All right, let's get the show on the road. It's time to tackle the Johto region. Wait, Oak? Aren't you the Kanto professor? Well, at least he's got the ground-themed outfit. And he'll be six feet under soon, so he's really getting into the role. <laughs> oh god, a water type! And there's water over there, and grass on the trees. Why is the entire world acting against us? Hello there, brother. Do you know where the closest 7-Eleven go? Oh, Choosing our starter Pokemon, I decide to go with Cyndaquil, who I named Fury. Unfortunately, there's no Gen 2 starter that gets the ground type, but this will give our rival Totodile, who I imagine will be the biggest threat. You know, it's occurred to me I've never really checked the upstairs of Elm's lab. I want to... Uh, oh my god. Are you hostages? In Cherry Grove, we follow a creepy old man around, and he really scared me, but I think it scared Fury even more. Perhaps it was when he threatened to drown him or something, I don't know. Rudely interrupting Oak and Mr. Pokemon's, um, activities. We get tasked with hatching an egg, but I just throw it in the PC, because... I'm a savage. Classy, bougie, ratchet. Now, I don't know how I made this mistake. I completely forgot about the silver battle up ahead, so I hadn't trained at all, and he was just spamming Leer, so I was like, maybe we've got this. But a second scratch smashes us to, I kid you not, one singular HP before we outspeed and take him down the next turn. Goodness gracious. That's not even supposed to be the hard part of this. Oh, and while telling the police his name, I accidentally forgot the L in it for some reason. Well, I mean, come on. If we want the W, we just can't have that. On the first route, Lyra then gives us some Pokeballs officially starting our run. Now, I'm gonna tell you straight up, our first encounter is a Geodude, and a lot of people think that the Dark Cave is where you get him initially, but nope, it's just north of the first route in fact, on Route 46 right nearby. We find one and fortunately catch the damn thing on our very last Pokeball, and name her Jolene. Jolene has a hasty plus speed and minus defense nature, which is actually pretty good. Geodude needs speed, but doesn't necessarily need more defense. Then, just like Jake Paul, it's time to box Fury. Except that, uh, wait, didn't he lose? Apparently our mom is sad that we're leaving home at age 10 for some reason. But more important than that, we're gonna have her save our money as she can get you some great items you can't get otherwise. Even things like the choice scarf. In no time, we arrive at the first gym location, Violet City. And here, there's something very special awaiting us in the Pokemon Center. A man named Primo who was actually the Tichi TV guy from Fire Red and Leaf Green. And if you tell him special codes based on your trainer ID, he will give you one of three Pokemon 
eggs, one of which actually has a viable encounter for us. He can also get you special wallpapers for your PC that you can't get anywhere else, and some of them are quite epic. After running around like a madman, our egg eventually hatches, netting us a whooper, which I named Rick, and who has a rash plus special attack and minus special defense nature, which is meh. Might help us early on though. Now suddenly, a major problem occurs to me. We have to take on the Sprout Tower next, but uh... We have two Pokemon that are four times a week to grass, and there are Bellsprout with Vine Whip all throughout, and a minus defense nature on Jolene too. Thankfully, the Bellsprout are at relatively low level, so barring a crit, we're able to make our way up. And we do learn Rock Throw too, which helps a lot. With that said, by the top floor, Jolene was getting too high of a level, so I had to switch train with Rick in order to split the XP, which was incredibly dangerous, giving them a crit chance every time, but at least Rock Throw is a one-hit KO now. Then, the big challenge comes in the form of the Elder. He leads with... Yup, you guessed it, a bell sprout as I get Jolene out. Rock throw hits and one hit KOs thanks to our plus speed nature, and then in comes a second, which we do the same to. Beautiful. Then in comes Hoot Hoot. Now you would imagine this would be like no challenge at all, but I switch into Rick here since we need to split the XP again. Then back to Jolene. Peck does like nothing on us, but then he hits a Hypnosis. With Peck doing 1 HP per hit and him starting to growl us to lower our attack, I was actually getting a bit worried that he might start putting us in a dangerous range, but Jolene came through quite quickly to 1 hit KO him despite the minus 1 attack. Whew. Our next challenge is the first gym, Violet Cities, led by gym leader Faulkner, who we can thankfully go straight to. At face value, I like our prospects here, I gotta say. He leaves with a Pidgey, and I get Jolene out. With Rock Throw having low accuracy to begin with, I had one thing I was fearing, the sand attack, and yup, he hit one right away, and we miss. Oh no. Then, he just goes for tackle, but we miss again. Fortunately, he went for tackle again, and then we finally hit one for the KO. But then, in comes Pidgeotto. Now yes, we both resist and have super effectiveness against it, but he has Gust, a special move, and our special defense is garbage. With our low accuracy, we then miss two more in a row before getting brought below half already. Uh-oh. We then hit one, but it barely doesn't KO, and he has recovery with Roost. Thankfully, we do hit another, but he loses the flying type after the roost, so it's no longer super effective. This is not good. We get him around half again before he hits us to 12 HP, then we land another, and it gets the job done. Damn, I was not expecting a flying trainer to be that scary with a Geodude on hand, but we got through it for our first badge. To the east, we can grab the Rock Smash HM, and if you're familiar with this game, you'll know we can hit up the Ruins of Alf to now get colored shards from the rocks, which we can then trade to the Shard to Berry Guy in Violet for almost any berry in the game. Let's go. Picking up the Shell Bell with the help of Rock Smash as well, we can then enter the Union Cave. And it's very rare we can actually get an encounter in here, but this time we can. One of two, either Onyx or Sandshrew. And it ends up being the latter, which I catch and nickname Iron Bar, and who has a hearty neutral nature. I'll take it. Oh, and we can also get the Rock Tomb TM in here too. Handy. Okay, I know it's a bit of a dead meme at this point, but never before has a dialogue from a Pokemon NPC been more sus. With that out of the way, we arrive in Azalea Town where the next gym is. Dealing with Kurt's broken back in the Slowpoke well, we have to give some payback to the Rockets. And you know what? I'm determined to make our Sand True like the one from the anime. You know the one. Iron Bar performs amazingly in the well, smashing Rattatas left and right, and even taking things down like Proton's coughing with relative ease, even after getting poisoned. It's time for the Azalea Gym, a Bug-type gym, and Jolene goes on an absolute rampage in here. Having same type attack bonus or stab rock throw against all the Pokemon, crushing things like even Beedrill without a second thought. That gets us to Gym Leader Bugsy quite quickly, who I'm actually a bit nervous about. Why, you might ask? Well, he leaves with a level 17 Scyther, who, yes, we have 4 times super effectiveness against, but he has U-Turn, which does nearly half damage off the bat and lets him pivot into other Pokemon. Fortunately, Metapod is no problem, then in it comes again, but thank god he just went for focus energy, so a rock throw annihilates him. Holy. Another U-turn, and we legit would have lost that because he could have come in again and just did it again. Wouldn't have expected that at all going into this with four times super effectiveness. Regardless, from there Kakuna just lands a poison sting which does poison us, but Rock Throw takes him down in one hit and saves us the hassle. Two badges. The threat is not over yet though, as up next we have another rival battle with Silver, and straight up his team is terrifying for us now. But I think I have a bit of a plan. 
He leaves with a ghastly and I leave with Jolene. He merely hits a mean look, fine by me, as Rockthrow takes advantage of his low defense and knocks him out. But then, in comes a massive threat, Croconaw. Yup, a second stage Pokemon with four times super effective stab damage, but we have a hidden trick as I can send in Rick, who has the water absorbability and isn't damaged by it at all. Yes. From here, I can now bait him into using Scary Face, a stat lowering move because the AI tends to do that when you lower their stats, which I can do with Mudshot. He did start using Rage to raise his attack and then hit a massive power bite below half, but our berry did help, but then Rick flinched. Oh no. I have to switch now as Bite is too powerful and it's risky, but I know he shouldn't try to use a water move on Rick, and he didn't, so Jolene tanks Rage with ease. But I need to hope that our plus speed nature combined with EVs just in case we needed them pull off, and my calcs tell me that it's an 85% chance to get enough power with magnitude or the 90% accuracy chance of hitting a rock throw, so I go for the latter, and we do hit it, taking out what is arguably the biggest threat in the game until now. Sheesh. His final Pokemon is a Zubat which fortunately misses its supersonic and gets obliterated in one hit. Well then, we can't use Jolene until the next gym leader though thanks to the level cap. The forest is watched over by its protector. Stay out of mischief. Oh, okay, will do ma'am. Go crazy! Ah, go stupid! Ah. Oh wow, this must be the shrine of the forest protector. <laughs> Iron Bar, what the hell is wrong with you? After wheeling one of the kimono girls, Iron Bar then... Dude, what? The sky is dazzling you? We can't even see it in here. This protector watches over the forest from across time. I think that it must be a grass-type Pokemon. Oh, now you've done it. Look at our team, do you think we can deal with that? Getting out of there as fast as we can, we then arrive in Goldenrod City where the next gym is. This place has a ton of great items for us, including the Shadow Claw TM we can win at the Drawing Center, and also some great TMs like Reflect and Light Screen. Ho oh, oh. ho, alright, yeah, now that's the type of strength I want you to have, buddy. Looking at the prizes, I have a feeling the game corner is going to be real useful real soon, but we'll wait for a bit later to grind it out. After winning a radio card at the tower, we... Hey, hey, don't talk to me or my son ever again. Going up north before the gym, we make it to Route 35 where we can get another encounter. This time, a Nidoran male, which I nickname Feral. Feral has a rash, plus special attack, and minus special defense nature, not bad at all. In no time, Feral evolves into a Nidorino too, but the problem is he's got rivalry, which lowers our attack if we're facing the opposite gender, but raises it against the same. With that, it's time for the Goldenrod City Gym. Now, we faced this gym with a Geodude before in our Rock-type run to great effect, so even though he technically doesn't have the Ground-type yet, I wanted to add a bit of a challenge by tackling it with Feral. Most Monotype Nuzlockers use Pokemon even if they get the type eventually anyway, so for the purpose of added difficulty, I think it'll slide. Problem is, all the Pokemon in here are female, and combined with things like Intimidate on Snubble, even something like Double Kick isn't as efficient as one might think. Regardless, we make it to the third gym leader, the infamous Whitney. She leads with a Clefairy, and I get feral out there. Now this thing having metronome can be a real danger, but thankfully we get the leer off before she just went for double slap. We get infatuated by cute charm on our very first attack though, but feral ain't fallen for those tricks as another attack takes her down. Then in comes Miltank. Attract works on us right away, but all I want to do here is get Leers off to lower her defense. We get brought to 20 HP by Stomp before our berry, and we get a second one off before switching into Jolene. Now, the amazing thing is, not only does Jolene resist every move that she has, but being female is also immune to Attract. I get a defense curl off, and then two rock polishes to raise our speed, that way we can no longer get flinched by Stomp. And this plan works really well, although she did crit us unexpectedly to just 10 HP before our berry. But a few rock throws and magnitudes from there, even though she kept spamming Milk Drink for recovery, did the job thanks to a last minute magnitude 9 crit. Wild. After getting the Squirt Bottle next door... Uh, I'm getting flashbacks to our last run. Squirtmander? Ew! We can hit up the Pokeathlon. Amazingly, we're here on the right day, as one of the prizes is a Moonstone, which we can grab a couple of after some hardcore... well, huh. Is Pokeathloning the correct verb here? Breaking through the fence in the National Park nets us the Dig TM, fantastic for a ground run, and also the Soothe Bell, but I don't think ground types care too much about friendship if I'm honest. Route 36 nearby nets us a new encounter opportunity, this time a Nidoran female, who I nickname Imperator, and who has a quiet plus special attack and minus speed nature. Half great and half bad, but I'll take the plus special attack for sure. 
Then came the Sudowoodo Saga. I was there all, ah, we can handle a rock type with ease, especially with a water and ground type. But I always seem to forget this damn thing has flail, which can have up to 200 power at low health, and it smashed us with one after barely surviving water gun and getting a crit low kick, and Rick tanked it on one singular HP before his berry. Goodness gracious. Nearly having lost a Pokemon, we make it to Ecruteak City, and before anything, I head east to get another Shadow Claw TM and the Strength HM too. Doing some training, we have an Evolution Bonanza. As Imperator evolves into a Neat Arena, one step closer to that ground typing, and Iron Bar also evolves into a Sand Slash. And one thing I didn't realize, this thing's moveset in Gen 4 is abysmal. I mean, just look at this. Oh well. Finally, Rick also evolves into a fully evolved Quagsire, who is quite an underrated bulky boy. Not only that, but a man in the dance theater gives us the Surf HM, our best water move by far at the moment, especially with a plus special attack nature. One final evolution is in the cards though, as I use a Moonstone to evolve Feral into a monster Nido King, and we can teach him some pretty darn special TMs from the game corner. Another frightening battle with Silver awaits us, this time in the Burned Tower. But I'm hoping our team is a bit more prepared this time around. Against his Ghastly, I lead with our newly evolved Iron Bar, who I taught the Shadow Claw TM to, which wipes it off the map, but he did land a curse on us. Then, in comes Croconaw. Expecting the water move, I went into Rick. Then, knowing we'd bait a non-water move now, I safely switch into Feral. He did lower our speed though, but just went for it again surprisingly. Then we nail him with a 95 power super effective Thunderbolt, and it fries him. Let's go! Zubat was then, of course, a one-hit KO with the same move after he missed Supersonic again, and finally his Magnemite could be easily handled by a double kick, although he did hit us to nearly half with Confusion and Sonic Boom combined. Whoa, would you look at that? It can't be- Oh, great. Good one, Iron Bar. You scared off the three rarest Pokemon in the region. Why are you the way that you are? Huh. Well, this seems rather dangerous. No, Iron Bar, no! Game over! Well, it's time for the Ecruteak Gym full of Ghost-type trainers. And teaching Feral our second Shadow Claw TM is a great idea, as not only can we breeze through them, but he's also our only Pokemon who would appreciate the crazy number of special attack EVs you get from Ghastly and Haunter. Along the way, our starter evolves, with Jolene becoming a bulkier and more powerful Graveler right at the level cap. At the end of the gym stands the fourth gym leader, Morty. His team is always terrifying, and no, not just because it's full of ghosts, but because he has status moves and crazy speed everywhere. And I suppose I should mention the 130 base special attack Gengar with an 80 power stab Shadow Ball, which does not help this early in the game. I lead with Feral against his Ghastly, and we outspeed it immediately for the Shadow Claw KO with no nonsense. And the same goes for his Haunter too, thanks to our speed EVs. Then in comes the big threat, Gengar. But he just went for Mean Look right away, then Shadow Claw somehow doesn't KO, and his berry brings him above half. Then he lands a massive power Shadow Ball, but we tank it below half with no crit. Then another attack takes him down. His final Pokemon is a stronger Haunter, and not wanting to risk a priority Sucker Punch crit, I switch into Iron Bar to play it safe, and he went for Mean Look as well, so after he curses on the next turn, we can smash him with a Shadow Claw for the win. I had a Chesto Berry on Feral too, so even if he had tried to put us to sleep, that was a pretty safe battle. It was at this point I started getting those ideas about a potential deathless run, given how our team's shaping up. Oh, uh, Wakan Berries, to help against electric moves. Yeah, thanks mom, M much appreciated. Up ahead we meet B B -u -b -b -d who's gonna let us know when the Safari Zone is open, amazing as we have many potential encounters in there. Ah, uh, they just won't let you escape the mill tank trauma in this game, will they? Ah, uh, come on, let's run away from them. Oh, f***. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, how, how are things? Boy, am I ever grateful to have Rick. Not only a great conversationalist, but also, without him, the water routes here would devastate us. With Rick's help, we safely arrive in Xianwood City, where the next gym is. Beforehand, I go to the Safari Zone entrance, and the lady at the counter is all hyped about it opening soon, but the workers say not to get her expectations too high. I love how the developers said this, and then proceeded to create the best Safari Zone of all time. Too humble. 
Before the next gym, I got another Moonstone to evolve Imperator fully into a beastly Nido Queen. Should be quite good in her own right. Hitting up the gym, we make it quickly to the fifth gym leader, Chuck, the fighting specialist. And I think I have a reasonable method of countering his team. He leads it with a Prime Ape, and I get Iron Bar out there who has quite high defense. Only problem being, his Prime Ape has both Leer to lower our defense, Rock Slide to flinch us, and spams Double Team to make us miss repeatedly. It was hell getting through him, and we of course got no defense drops on him from Crush Claw, even though he crit us, but Iron Bar tanks him out at half health to take him down with a third one. Then, in comes Poliwrath, a Pokemon that, without Rick, would demolish our entire team straight up with one Hikeo Surfs. With that said, Rick can use Yawn before getting Focus Punched hard below half. But I know as long as I attack, he can only hit Body Slams, so I go for Dink to be underground as he falls asleep. Then we get a bit of damage off. Knowing he won't use a water move on Rick, I then switch safely into Feral, and I had a Chesto Berry even if he landed a Hypnosis. A Thunderbolt from that range, then only brings him to the red on a sliver, but he stayed asleep and we could land one more to get the fifth badge. Whew. At the top of the lighthouse, we then go heal the sick Ampharos and... Whoa, jeez, whoa, whoa, whoa! Holy, good thing we've got all ground types. Leaving the lighthouse, we then get the call that the Safari Zone is open, which is very exciting for us. With that said, I decide to hit up the Olivine City Gym while we're here. Normally, I go here after the Mahogany one, since, weirdly enough, Jasmine's Ace is at a higher level than the canonical 7th Gym Leader, but I feel pretty good about this one. Why, you might ask? Well, against her Magnemite, I can lead with Rick, who outspeeds even Ed with 4 times damage Stab Dig for the instant KO. Then, in comes her Ace, Steelix. But, we also have 95 power Stab Super Effective Surf, and it does huge damage before Iron Tail is resisted by Rick, so another takes her down. Finally, all she's got is a second Magnemite, so Rick, you know what to do. The absolute perfect Jasmine counter, honestly, what a chad. The beautiful Route 47 along the river brings us to the Cliff Cave, where we can find an encounter that we lost out on earlier, Onyx, which I catch and nickname People Eater. Yep. Not only that, but the next route, Route 48, also has an encounter for us, although it's only a 4% chance to find, so it took a while. Diglett, which I catch and nickname Giddy. Those two routes lead us to yet another encounter location, the Safari Zone itself. Checking our new catches in the PC, it turns out People Eater has a serious neutral nature, and Giddy has a sassy plus special defense and minus speed nature. Given that her speed is so good anyway, I suppose that's not bad. And I do have a few ideas for this thing, but looking ahead at the next gym, I I'm gonna take People Eater on the team for now. Hitting up the Safari Zone, and after accidentally searching in the Wasteland biome before realizing it wasn't the desert area, it turns out the desert isn't available until after you unlock area customization a bit later. Whoops, we'll be back. A long journey to the east has us arrive in Mahogany Town where the next gym is. Huh, this tree looks a little odd. Up north at the Lake of Rage, we can grab one of the greatest items in the game using Surf, the Choice Specs, which should be incredible for our Nidos in particular. And finding the Red Gyarados in the lake, I realized I accidentally forgot to attach it for Feral's Thunderbolt, which somehow doesn't KO, but thankfully Gyarados doesn't have any water moves at this point, otherwise that would have been a devastating mistake. Oh my god, it's Lance and his Dragonite. Quick, Nido King, assert dominance with a T-Pose. Okay, not sure how well that worked, but uh... Whoa, what? Lance, you didn't have to kill someone to prove a point. I j okay, you win, you win. Grabbing the Thief TM and the Rocket Hideout to pick up tight boosting items later, we run into, uh, hey, hey, you watch that language around me, young bird. To finish this place off, we have to face Team Rocket Executive Ariana <clears throat> Grande with Lance by our side. She leads with an Intimidate Arbok, not ideal, but I got Feral out there so Intimidate isn't an issue. She did paralyze us with Glare, but ultimately we could spam Thunderbolt against everything including her Merc- Okay, nope. Lance blasted it with a Thunder. Man, he's asserting dominance real hard right about now. I bet we can take out the Electrodes before him though. Sorry Electrodes, you don't have a hope in hell against this team. Ah, damn it. Upon getting a Metal Coat from the Pokeathlon on a Tuesday, I could trade evolve People Eater into a Gargantuan Steelix. And I also trade evolve Jolene to get a Golem, quite a powerful threat. 
Taking People Eater into the Mahogany Gym, he is a great counter to all the ice types in here. Being able to decimate them with a stab 100 power super effective Iron Tail we got as a TM from Jasmine. And although it's only 75% accuracy, I did get the wide lens for him in the game corner to help. It's time for the 7th Gym Leader, Price, and I think we're set up reasonably well here. He leaves with a seal, and I get People Eater out. Unfortunately, seal is a pure water type, but I figure there's no way we'll have problems here regardless, and I was wrong. He went for hail on the first turn, and I got the sandstorm up to thwart it. A good start. Then he reset it, and I went for rock polish to raise our speed. We then missed our iron tail and got our speed dropped by icy wind and hurt by hail. Are you kidding me? We then miss again and get our speed dropped yet again. Why is this happening? He now starts out speeding us and suddenly we're at half health with minus one speed and Iron Tail doesn't quite KO. He then goes for rest and heals fully after which I reset Sandstorm at least. While he's asleep I take the opportunity to get our speed back up with two more rock polishes but then miss Iron Tail again as he wakes up. Why? We then hit one and get a crit to finish that damn thing off. No words. In comes Pylos Y next, and not wanting all that to go to waste, I go for Iron Tail and miss again as the hail goes up. I was so mad, so I just went for another, and it barely doesn't KO on a sliver somehow. Then he lands a mud bomb, and People Eater survives on just 9 HP. But then the hail hits, and we survive on just 2 HP. Holy. Okay, it is time to switch as in comes Rick. 100% accuracy blizzard hits us hard in combination with hail, and then he lands another. But no crit, but he gets the freeze. Are you absolutely kidding me? We then stay frozen and are suddenly below half even after our citrus berry. I'm forced to switch, but we have nothing not weak to blizzard, but Imperator is our bulkiest bet, and she indeed survives it on a third before our berry, then we land a double kick to KO that damn thing. His final Pokemon is Dugong, and knowing we should be able to survive an attack, I go for double kick to just about half, then Aurora Beam hits us to a quarter. I then switch into Feral, knowing we're in range of a KO, and he tanks an attack to half before being able to end the battle with a Thunderbolt. Holy, that battle was completely absurd. I no longer like Price at all. I am very, very disappointed in you, buddy. I think I'm going to put People Eater in timeout and take Giddy the Diglet along with us. After much training to get him to learn Earthquake by level up, I then evolve Giddy into Dugtrio, and Eevee trained the heck out of him in speed and attack to create a monster. Giddy is glowing with health! Yeah, no wonder, you haven't fought a day in your life. It's time for you to put some work in. And put work in, she most certainly does. Demolishing all the rockets in the Goldenrod Radio Tower with a Supreme Power Earthquake and Slash. Go, Giddy, go! Near the top, we run into a disguised Petrol who challenges us to battle. Now against his near-infinite coughings and wheezings with self-destruct, we have a great counter in the form of Jolene, who resists not only those, but four times resists their poison moves too. I also attach the metronome item to progressively increase the power of our strength move every time it's used consecutively, but the very first coughing on his very first sludge poisoned us, so we didn't make it too far. <sighs> From there though, I could switch in Feral who also quad resist poison and could choice specs flamethrower the rest of his team into the netherworld. That works too, I guess. In the basement, we encounter our arch nemesis Silver for another battle, this time with his team super powered up. But I have a secret weapon this time, as he leads with Golbat. I get Giddy out there, and knowing he will likely try to confuse us, I went for substitute, and he does to no effect. I then use Priority Sucker Punch for over half, then Bite doesn't even break our subs, so another one takes him down. Let's go! Then in comes Feraligator, and with the sub up I can stay in and Earthquake him low, and he missed Ice Fang anyway, so another takes him down. Oh man, absolutely free! From there his Sneasel got Earthquake one hit KO'd, then Haunter could have been Priority Sucker Punched, but kept using status moves as if it knew to waste our power points. This AI is OP, so I had to switch in Iron Bar for the Shadow Claw KO on it, then with us cursed, I played it safe against Magnemite with the Imperator switch to flamethrower him for the victory. Giddy is elite. With that, the final rocket battle awaits us in the last room. Archer, the Team Rocket Admin. And I think we have the perfect answer to his team. Our starter, Jolene, as he leads with Houndour. 
He hits a bite for not much, but we flinch, and then he hits another, and we flinch again, before a third one finally allows us to rock polish. Man, oh man. I then eviscerate it with Earthquake before coughing then comes in. Good thing is, I had a Rostberry attached, so even if we had gotten burned, we were safe, as coughing then goes down to a few strengths, although it did lower our accuracy with smokescreen, and we missed one attack. Then got poisoned. Why is life this way? With us on like a quarter health, it may look grim, but don't forget that with a speed boost, we can even outdo his Houndoom, landing a 100 power stab super effective earthquake for the victory. Good riddance. Back near Mahogany, I remembered to grab the Sludge Bomb TM from the Gate Guard now that the rockets have disbanded, after which we can head way over to the Ice Cave. Funnily enough, we actually have an encounter here as I grab a Swinub, which I catch and nickname Humongous. We'll just call him Hugh. In here is a crucial HM too, Waterfall, finally giving Rick a physical water move. We can also grab the Avalanche TM and a Never Melt Ice to power up ice moves, which I think will be quite handy. A short trip through brings us to our final gym destination, Blackthorn City. Checking out Hugh in the PC, he has a Rash plus special attack and minus special defense nature. Not great, but not terrible, I suppose. For the next gym, I'm gonna replace Jolene with him for now. With some training, Hugh evolves into a Pyloswine, and shortly thereafter, I find out the Safari Zone customization is finally unlocked. Before that, though, luckily the move reminder is right here in Blackthorn, so I can teach Hugh both Ancient Power and Ice Fang, too. Leveling him up with Ancient Power is exactly exactly how you evolve Piloswine as he becomes a powerful Mamoswine. Wicked. With a full team of six regardless, let's hit up the Blackthorn City Gym. As one might expect, Hugh performs incredibly in here, ice fanging all the dragons into oblivion, and even having enough bulk and the strength move combined with priority ice shard to handle the pesky water types like Seedra. The eighth and final gym leader is Claire, the dragon type expert, and with two water types, her team is quite a threat to ours. But I think I have a plan. She leads with an intimidate Gyarados, so our only answer here was leading with Feral with the choice specs, giving our four times damage Thunderbolt enough power to get the one hit. Then, in comes an even greater threat, Kingdra. But knowing she'll go for Hydro Pump, I can get Rick out there to cancel it out. Then, she lowers our accuracy, but I start trying to damage her as much as I can with Earthquake. We did miss our second one, and then she lands a massive power Hyper Beam, which does just over half before our berry. We did bring her to the red at one point before her berry, then on her recharge turn we could land a final one to take her down. Being able to bait her into Hyper Beam was amazing. Then, in comes Dragonair. With our accuracy low, we tank one Dragon Pulse to a third before landing a Yawn. Then, knowing she wouldn't use Aqua Tail against Rick, I can safely switch into Hugh, being hit hard by a crit Dragon Pulse, but then she falls asleep. Never Melt Ice boosted Ice Fang, then one hit KOs her, and in comes her final Pokemon, another Dragonair. It's a 5% accuracy risk, but I think I need to go for it, and we land the final Ice Fang to win the battle and her 8th badge, Deathless. That is huge. Also, small note, but I find it interesting in the Dragon's Den how this is the grandfather and elder of the whole clan, yet he appeals to Lance in trying to scare Claire into behaving. Just shows you his power. Heading south of Blackthorn actually nets us a new encounter. A hard gold exclusive, in fact, a fanpy, which I name Entity. This is gonna cancel Gligar out as a possible encounter, but the Razor Fang to evolve it is locked in the post game anyway, so I can't complain. Checking the PC, it turns out Entity has a Jolly plus speed and minus special attack nature. Pretty much perfect. So I'm gonna replace Iron Bar with him for now. With some training under his belt, Entity eventually evolves into a Dawn Fan, a Pokemon I have dreamt about using in a Nuzlocke for so long. I can't wait. Also, fun fact, Fan P and Dawn Fan have the exact same HP stat? Weird, I know. Heading back to the Safari Zone, we can now use the Area Customizer to get the Desert Biome, in which I was going to search for a Cubone, but found a Marowak instead. Not good, actually, as it's harder to catch, but after four balls, it somehow didn't flee. We nearly lost that encounter. Also, Cubone's supposed to evolve at level 28, so don't ask me how this thing is level 17. I name him Rockatan, and he has a bashful neutral nature with Rockhead too. Unfortunately, the Thick Club item that doubles his attack power is exclusive to Kanto. Or is it? That's right, the Pokewalker comes in clutch this time around, the only other way to get one. After completely maxing out Entity's attack EVs, attaching the soft sand item from Blackthorn, and maxing him out near the level cap, and attaching an XP share on another Pokemon to lessen the XP gain, it's time for the five consecutive battle Kimono Girls. With things like Umbreon, Espeon, and Vaporeon, they are huge threats. But with all that combined with a 120 base attack stat, Earthquake is literally one of the most powerful 
powerful attacks in the game. Even still, Umbreon barely survives and confuses us, but I can switch into Humongous to finish him off with Ice Shard, as I didn't want any damage on Entity as you don't get to heal between battles. Espeon did outspeed and hit us to half with Psychic, but then it, the subsequent Flareon, and Jolteon all got wiped off the map with a single Earthquake each. The final Kimono Girl has a Vaporeon though, however, with the Soft Sand, 100 Power, 120 Base Attack, and Stab, it amazingly even destroys that bulky thing in one hit, allowing us to go deathless through all five. Entity, you legend. Arriving at the top of the bell tower, the legendary Ho-Oh awaits us. And I thought Rick would do fine handling it, but it not only hit a fire blast on first turn, but also got the burn too. Rick ended up super low in the red before landing a yawn, and I could switch an entity to finish him off while he was asleep with a couple thunder fangs. We just can't catch a break, can we? Moving on, we get to the perilous Victory Road. And fortunately, there aren't any regular trainers in here, so we can pick up the best TM in the game for our team, Earthquake. And also, we can pick up our final encounter in here, a 5% chance, Rhyhorn, which I named Colossus. Unfortunately, the protector item to fully evolve it is only obtainable after all 16 badges, so... I'll leave him in the box for now. At the end of the road stands our final rival battle with Silver, and this time I led with Rick against his Sneasel. All I wanted to do here was put it to sleep with Yawn before switching Gideon to tank a faint attack before he fell asleep. Then I could substitute and take him down with an Earthquake. In comes Feraligator next, which tanks an Earthquake on half and then breaks our sub. However, we can outspeed it, so another one takes down the biggest threat to our team. Golbat then comes in, and we're too low to stay in, so I get Hugh out there to tank a mere bite before crushing him with Ice Fang. I kid you not, Hugh then proceeded to devastate Magneton with Earthquake, Haunter with Ice Fang, and then Cadaver with an Earthquake as well to sweep through for the W. Beastly. With Victory Road behind us, we've arrived at our final destination, the Indigo Plateau Pokemon League. After fulfilling the rest of our AVs and getting any remaining items and TMs we might need, it's time for the Elite Four. The first Elite Four member is Will, the Psychic type trainer. His lead is an interesting one though, Zatu, so I lead with Hugh against him for the outspeed and instant one hit KO with Ice Fang. Then in comes Slowbro, a big threat to our team, but I stay in with the Earthquake for over half. Fortunately, he just went for Amnesia so we can smash him with the Nether to take him down but Water Pulse Confusion was the only real risk there. Jinx's frailty then causes it to go down in one hit as well, and then in comes Executor. Stab's super effective Ice Fang somehow doesn't KO it in the red though, and he uses Reflect. Not good, but I can stall it out a bit knowing he'll full restore, so two more hit him to the red again, and Psychic slams us to nearly half before one more attack KOs. In comes his final Pokemon, a stronger Zatu, and I stay in with the Ice Fang to below half, and it gets the freeze. His Barry then heals him, but perfect timing as Reflect now wears off. So now we have the range to get the victory. Beautiful. The second Elite Four member is Koga the Poison Master. Quite an unfortunate matchup here for him, isn't it? And I think we have the perfect answer. He leads with an area dose as I get Feral out there for the flamethrower to burn him to cinders. The same goes for his Venomoth, and after that, his Fortress takes an almighty 4 times damage blow right to the dome. Feral has gone, dare I say, feral. In comes Crobat next, and here I can switch to Ice Beam, which one hit KOs him after he double teams. His final Pokemon is then Muck, and our newly learned Stab Super Effective Earth Power hits, and completes the 5 for 5 sweep to end the battle. Damn, son, that is some coverage. The third Elite Four member is Bruno, the fighting type specialist, and his team was a bit tricky to plan around, but eventually the answer came to me. Against his hip on top, I lead with Rick as he went under for Dig, which hits us for not much before we land the yawn. Then, I switch into Rockatan, who I brought along for our League Challenge as he fell asleep underground. Then, I use Substitute, followed by Swords Dance as he stayed asleep. From there, Earthquake devastated him as a plus 2, 100 power stab, thick club, 160 base attack move hits. Hitmonchan then did break our sub before being destroyed too, then Hitmonlee unfortunately landed a Swagger to confuse, and we slammed ourselves hard to 30 HP in the red. Oof. Aside from that one move, we would have been able to accomplish a lot more. But now I have to switch in Feral. Earth Power does not quite enough before we get confused again, but we break through to take him down. When Onyx comes in, I switch into Entity to tank Earthquake really well and respond with our own for the one-hit KO. 
His final Pokemon is Machamp, which hits us hard with Cross Chop, but Entity is a physically defensive and offensive monster, tanking his attacks with ease and taking him down in two earthquakes. The last Elite Four member is Karen, the Dark-type expert. Hugh took down her Umbreon in two hits despite getting confused, then I know Houndoom will outspeed, so I switch into Rick to take the Flamethrower. Then all she did was Nasty Plot before Earthquake demolished her. Vileplume is a massive threat for Rick though, so I switch in Imperator, but Petal Dance does more than half with a crit. Sheesh. Ice Beam then does three quarters before another brings us below half and she gets confused, so another one takes her down. Knowing that Imperator's got enough bulk, I stay in against Murkrow, but it turns out Pluck actually did 1 HP more than half HP, so a crit would have KO'd us. But regardless, Ice Beam then smashes her. Her final Pokemon is Gengar, and this is a tricky one. It outspeeds everything we have and has Destiny Bond, which would take down any Pokemon of ours that KOs it. I end up going for Entity with the Assurance for over half, and then kind of stall it out with Charm to see what it's gonna do. And she did go for Destiny Bond eventually, so I stall out with Charm and then attack on the next turn, and she went for Spite that turn, so a final Assurance takes her down. Well, here we go. The final battle, the champion of the Indigo Plateau, Lance the Dragon Master. Now his team is absurdly powerful, but I had one idea in mind. Problem is, his Gyarados kind of ruins it. But I can lead with Rick to take the Intimidate and then get the Yawn off, knowing that he can't do much damage to us. Once he's asleep, I then switch into Feral, and it looks weird, I know, but I go for Ice Beam. Why not Thunderbolt? Well, I have the Choice Specs on. Knowing this would be a 2-hit KO against the Gyarados, I can now proceed to Choice Specs 4 times damage, 1-hit KO, all 3 of his Dragonites consecutively. Yup, absolutely incredible. But Feral's not done yet. I stay in against Charizard, knowing it doesn't have a great type matchup against us, and that Ice is neutral on it, doing over half on our first, getting hit by Air Slash to half, and then landing another to take him down. Then, his final Pokemon is Aerodactyl, and Aerial Ice hits us with no crit, granting Feral the 6 for 6 sweep of Lance with a little help from Rick. Insane. We beat the champion of the Kanto and Johto regions, and Deathless too. But the hardest challenge still awaits us. We're not quite done yet. At the Olivine Harbor, none other than Professor Oak grants us the National Dex, and we can board the SS Aqua. This brings us to a brand new world, the Kanto region, arriving in the port city of Vermilion. And at this point, I go pick up an old friend from the PC. Who, you might ask? Well, it's none other than Jolene, who I use against Lieutenant Surge. With the ground typing, rock typing to protect against self-destruct, and rock polish to help us outspeed some of the fastest Pokemon in the game, we can sweep through his entire team with Earthquake. Not often do you see a golem outspeed an Electrode. And this is kind of a theme with the Kanto Gym Leaders. At this point, you have a fully EV trained team with great items, and against Sabrina, for instance, a big threat otherwise Otherwise, I brought Giddy back, going for Substitute, thinking Espeon would calm mind, and it worked. Black Glass's Sucker Punch then proceeds to smash her Espeon, then her Alakazam broke our sub with Energy Ball, and I went for Earthquake here knowing that she could have used Reflect. It doesn't quite KO, but then we can Priority Sucker Punch it from there, and the same goes for her Mr. Mime too. That Alakazam with Energy Ball and Psychic could have definitely ended our entire team to be honest. Erica, on the other hand, was a bit of a tricky one, as Nido can isn't good with rivalry against her. Problem being, her jump luff lead has Sunny Day and outspeeds our entire team, which would activate Chlorophyll for her whole team to outspeed and have one turn Solar Beam. So, I lead with Hugh for the 4 times damage stab priority Ice Shard KO. Then, could Ice Fang her Tangela, which hit us hard with Ring Out to half. From there though, knowing she'd heal, I could safely switch in Imperator, who could tank through the rest of her team with Ice Beam, helping our severe grass weakness with her part Poison Typing. Oh, no, no, no. Say the line, man. Say it. After Quagsire helped us to handle Misty, another big type threat, three of the remaining gym leaders were all weak to our type, such as Brock, who Entity swept through entirely. And we got a crucial TM from him, Brock Slide. After visiting a Nurse Joy who hadn't seen another human in three years, we arrive at our final destination, Mount Silver. And ironically enough, we technically have another encounter here, Larvitar who I catch as a keepsake in a Master Ball and name Valkyrie. However, it does lose the ground type upon fully evolving unfortunately, so not going to be very useful. In the mountain we find one of the best items in the game, the Expert Belt, before arriving at the summit. At the top stands a lone trainer, one who disappeared three years ago. The battle legend and former champion, Red himself. With no words needed, it's time to determine who's the real strongest trainer in the land. 
He leaves with his insane level 88 Pikachu as I get giddy on the field. I go for Sandstorm right away as I know controlling the weather is key here. Not only to avoid hail damage, but also to cancel out 100% accuracy blizzards too. He then smashes us with Iron Tail for huge damage, then on the next turn, out prioritizes us with Quick Attack, and Giddy survives on literally 1 HP. Damn. From there, I can outspeed and one-hit KO him with Earthquake. In comes Lapras next, and I have no choice here as this thing is a big threat. I get as much damage as I can with Earthquake on it before Giddy goes down. Our first death of the run. From here though, we can eliminate a massive threat as I get Imperator out there to knock Lapras out with a Thunderbolt. In comes another huge threat though, Blastoise, which lands a 70% Blizzard for over half and then Thunderbolt doesn't quite KO. Knowing he'd go for the full restore though, I can then hit him again, then he misses his next one so we can KO without losing Imperator. Let's go! In comes Snorlax next, a bulky Pokemon with no real weakness from our team, but I switch in Rick here who gets hit with a blizzard. Essentially, I just have two of the bulkiest boys in the game duke it out, and our berry helps us outdo him quite handily in the end. In comes one of the biggest threats in the game, Venusaur. And I'll be honest, nothing can safely switch into a frenzy plant, so... I let Rick go. But it turns out he only went for Giga Drain. Damn it. Here I send in Hugh for the stab super effective Ice Fang, which barely doesn't KO on a sliver in the red before he lands a Sleep Powder. Oof. Knowing he'll heal, I stay in, but we stay asleep. But then, we wake up on the next turn to hit him again, but he survives again and Giga Drain hits us, and it KOs in one hit. What? I was not expecting that. That's some power. He doesn't quite recover fully though, so I know that from that range, a Choice Specs Flamethrower from there can take him down. In comes Red's final Pokemon, Charizard. And with Flare Blitz and Air Slash, I know this is too big of a risk, so I just stay in to sack Imperator, but she miraculously survives Flare Blitz on just one singular HP. No way! Okay, knowing that this must be fate, I now switch into Entity, who tanks Dragon Pulse on two thirds, then he goes for Air Slash, and we don't flinch, so we land the four times damage Rock Slide from Box TM to finish him and end the battle. Oh man, Entity coming in clutch to save the two lovebirds from certain death. That was magnificent. Well, we did it. We beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Heart Gold with only ground types, and we did it deathless too, until red. Honestly, Entity the Dawn Fan and Giddy the Dug Trio are the MVPs of this run, but the Nidos did come in super handy as ever. As always, make sure to subscribe to join the Soul Army and get us to a quarter million. We're really close, and I'll see you guys next time for another challenge video.